Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're really diving into some fascinating new research. It's all about tackling a major health challenge, managing chronic kidney disease when it happens alongside type 2 diabetes. We're specifically looking at a clinical trial that explored a potentially better strategy for protecting both kidneys and heart in these patients. And the source for this is hot off the press, a paper just published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It gives us the results of a trial called Confidence. Confidence. <laughs> okay, let's unpack this one. So our mission here is to get a clear picture of what this trial was investigating, you know, what its key findings are, mm -hmm. especially about combining two specific kinds of medications and what that might mean for people actually living with these conditions. Exactly. Think of it as us boiling down this pretty dense study into the essential takeaways, getting you the crucial info without you having to navigate all the jargon. Right. So let's start with the basics. Why is this specific group, people with both chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes, why is focusing on them so important? What's the core problem? Yeah, that's really the crucial starting point. As the paper points out, when someone has both CKD and type 2 diabetes, their risk for really serious health problems just skyrocket. We're talking a much higher chance of things like heart attacks or strokes, major cardiovascular events. And also, their kidney disease tends to get worse faster, leading towards potential kidney failure, needing dialysis, maybe even a transplant. So it's a really vulnerable group. Managing both conditions effectively is critical. It sounds like a dangerous combination where each disease kind of fuels the other. That's a good way to put it. And thankfully, we do have tools, medications that are proven to help. The paper mentions several classes. The first, renin-angiotensin system inhibitors, or RAS inhibitors. Okay. Those are often the baseline treatment, and everyone in this trial was already taking them. Then you've got SGLT2 inhibitors, finer none. That's a non-steroidal MRA mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. Right. And also GLP-1 receptor agonists. Big studies have shown these can slow down kidney damage and cut down on heart problems. Okay, so we have these medications, this toolkit exists. This study is asking, can we use them better? Maybe together, right from the start. Precisely. That's the key question. There's been some uncertainty about combining SGLT2 inhibitors and finer nuns specifically. We know they work well on their own. Mm -hmm. And some earlier sort of secondary analyses hinted that maybe adding finer nun could give you an extra boost in reducing protein in the urine, even if someone's already on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Okay. But we didn't have solid proof from a big trial designed specifically to look at starting both together simultaneously, you know, in patients already on RES inhibitors. Right, because often the approach is more like add one, wait and see, maybe add another later. Yeah. Exactly, that stepwise approach. It often relies on expert opinion or waiting for test results. So confident step in to fill that gap. Hypothesize. What was the main question? They hypothesized that starting both finer enter and an SGLT2 inhibitor called empagliflozin at the same time would lead to a bigger drop in that urinary albumin to creatinine ratio, the UACR, that measure of protein leakage compared to starting just one or the other. And crucially, that doing this would be safe enough. Makes sense. And who were the participants? What kind of patients were they looking at? They enrolled people who had both type 2 diabetes and established chronic kidney disease. Specifically, their kidney function, the EGFR, was between 30 and 90, so moderate stages. Okay. And they also had significant protein in their urine, a UACR between 100 and 5,000. That range indicates, you know, meaningful kidney damage. Got it. Everyone was already on a stable dose of a RAS inhibitor, that foundational therapy. Okay, so these are folks already getting standard care. And the trial asks, what if we add finer in them? or empagliflozin, or both, straight away. Mm. How did they sort out who got what treatment? It was a really well-designed trial. Double-blind, randomized, active-controlled. Participants were randomly put into one of three groups. Nope. Group one got finer known plus a placebo that looked like empagliflozin. Group two got empagliflozin plus a finer known placebo. Uh -huh. And group three got the real deal, both active finer known and active empagliflozin. That randomization and blinding is key to making fair comparisons. Absolutely. And the main thing they were tracking, the primary outcome for kidney effects. That was the relative change in UACR from baseline from when they started after 180 days. Like we said, UACR is that key marker of kidney damage. Less protein leakage is the goal. Drum roll time. What did confidence actually find? Did the combination work better for reducing that protein leakage? This is really the headline finding. At 180 days, the combination therapy group, the ones getting both drugs, 
had a reduction in UACR that was significantly greater than either drug alone. It was 29% greater than with finernone alone and 32% greater than with empagliflozin alone. Wow, wait, 30% more reduction on top of what the single drugs already did? That sounds like a really big difference. It is substantial. If you look at the actual drop from the start, the combo group reduced their UACR by about 52%. Compare that to around 32% with just finer known and about 29% with just empagliflozin. The effects really do look additive. Like the combination delivers almost the sum of the parts, maybe even a bit more synergy. That's impressive. And was this effect slow to build or did it happen quickly? That's another fascinating part, the speed. The UACR drop with the combination was rapid. They saw a reduction of over 30% from baseline in just like 14 days, and it was over 40% down by 90 days. So you're getting a big effect and you're getting it fast. Okay, so reducing UACR sounds good, but you called it a surrogate endpoint. Mm -hmm. It's a marker, not the ultimate outcome like preventing kidney failure itself. How much weight can we put on this UACR reduction? That's a fair and important question, and the paper acknowledges this. UACR is a surrogate. This trial wasn't long enough to definitively count kidney failures or heart attacks. However, it's considered a valid surrogate. Why? Because decades of research, tons of studies, have shown a really strong link between reducing UACR and lowering the risk of those bad long-term outcomes. Okay. The paper cites a big meta-analysis, for example, which found that for every 30% drop in UACR, there was about a 27% lower risk of major kidney problems down the road. Uh. So when you see a 52% reduction, like in this trial's combo group, while it's not direct proof of preventing kidney failure in this trial, it's a very strong signal suggesting it could lead to much better long-term kidney and maybe heart protection. That makes sense. The marker is strongly predictive. Okay, so efficacy looks good, even great for the combination. Yeah. But what about safety? Combining drugs always raises flags about side effects. Absolutely. Safety was a huge focus. They looked closely at blood pressure, changes in kidney function, that EGFR number, and especially potassium levels. Right. Hyperkalemia did happen. But here's the interesting bit. It wasn't necessarily highest in the combination group. Investigator reported hyperkalemia was actually highest in the finer and alone group at 11.4%. The combo group was slightly lower at 9.3%, and empagliflozin alone was lowest at 3.8%. Yeah. And if you look at the lab data, potassium levels above 5.5, again, finer and alone had the highest rate, 18.6%. The combo was next at 15.3%, and empagliflozin alone was lowest at 9.7%. So wait, adding the SGLT2 inhibitor might have actually slightly lowered the risk of high potassium compared to just finer known by itself. That seems counterintuitive. It does at first glance, but it actually fits with other things we know. SGLT2 inhibitors can affect how the kidneys handle electrolytes, sometimes promoting sodium and water loss, which can indirectly influence potassium. So it suggests the empagliflozin might be helping to offset or mitigate some of finer anon's potassium raising effect. That could be a really useful interaction. What about kidney function itself, the EGFR? Did it take a big hit? They did see an initial dip in EGFR. That's pretty common when you start drugs, that lower pressure inside the kidneys filters. It's often a sign the drugs are working, in a way. Right. This dip was a bit more frequent early on with the combination. About 6.3% in the combo group had their EGFR drop by more than 30% at the 30-day mark. That compares to 3.8% with finer and loan and only 1.1% with empagliflozin. Okay, so a bigger initial dip with the combo. Did it stay down? It seems to have stabilized over the 180 days. And the paper notes that most of that initial drop bounced back after they stopped the medication at the end of the trial. So, largely reversible. Serious acute kidney injury was quite rare overall. What about blood pressure? Also affected. The combination led to a bigger drop in systolic blood pressure than either drug alone, about 7.4 points lower within 30 days. Hmm. Similar to the EGFR change, this effect seemed mostly reversible after stopping the treatment. And importantly, very few people felt symptoms from low blood pressure symptomatic hypotension was low across all groups. Overall, things looked pretty balanced. The number of people stopping treatment because of any adverse event was low, less than 5% in all groups. And serious adverse events were similar across the board, around 6-7%. It suggests that, you know, for this specific group over 180 days, the combination was generally tolerated reasonably well. So let's try and pull this all together. What's the main story from the confidence trial? Well, it really looks like starting finerone and empagliflozin together in these patients already on standard care gives you a much bigger and much faster reduction in that key kidney damage marker, the UACR. That 52% drop is really eye-catching compared to around 30% with the single drugs. 
Yeah, the size and speed of that UACR effect are probably the main headlines. And while you do see that initial EGFR dip and the absolute rate of hyperkalemia is higher than with empagliflozin alone, the overall safety seems manageable. And critically, the hyperkalemia risk with the combo actually looks a bit lower than with finernone alone. And you mentioned something earlier that the paper talks about maybe overcoming clinical inertia. What's that about? Right. Clinical inertia, it's basically the tendency in real world practice for treatment changes to get delayed. You know, maybe a doctor adds one drug, plans to check UACR again in a few months, things get busy, the follow-up test doesn't happen right away, or the decision to add the next drug gets postponed. This study suggests that maybe, just maybe, starting with the combination up front gets you that big UACR reduction much faster, potentially bypassing some of those real world delays. So the idea is you get more protection sooner. That seems to be the implication. If the safety is okay for the patient, getting that risk marker down significantly and quickly could be a real advantage. Now, no study is perfect. What are the key limitations we need to remember here? The big one, which the authors are upfront about, is the reliance on that surrogate endpoint, UACR, over just 180 days. Right. It wasn't long enough to see if the combination actually prevented more cases of kidney failure or heart attacks compared to the single drugs. So we saw the marker improve dramatically, but we don't have proof from this specific trial that it translates to fewer heart events in the long run. Correct. You're essentially betting on the known predictive power of UACR reduction. But on the plus side, it was a strong study design, randomized, double-blind, good follow-up patients from many countries. And that UACR effect was, frankly, pretty impressive. Okay, so let's recap this deep dive on confidence. For people with both CKD and type 2 diabetes already on standard meds like RAS inhibitors, starting finernonin and meglambofluzin together led to a much bigger and faster drop in protein leakage from the kidneys, UACR, over 180 days compared to starting either drug alone. And the safety profile looked generally manageable, with maybe even a slight advantage for the combo regarding high potassium compared to finernonin alone despite some expected early drops in EGFR and blood pressure. It really provides solid head-to-head -head evidence about this initial combination strategy, showing it can significantly boost the effect on that key surrogate marker for kidney risk. Which definitely leaves us with something to think about. If you can get a much larger, faster reduction in a marker strongly tied to bad outcomes, and the safety looks acceptable, does this challenge the way we usually add therapies one by one? is starting stronger with a combination like this, potentially a better path forward for protecting these really high-risk patients. That's all the time we have for this deep dive. Thanks for joining us.